Hey guys, editing Sandra here. Um, so I'm looking, well, editing this vlog and I just realised I haven't filmed an introduction clip for this video and the clip that I filmed for the Tuesday, I don't actually like it so I don't want to put it up. Um, but obviously first, I need to introduce the vlog. So this is the second vlog I'm doing for the August in Africa readathon and I decided to pick up Purple Hibiscus, which is by Chamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll start with me introducing what the book is about. So I'll read the back. Um, the limits of 15 year old Kambili's world are defined by the high walls and franchi panny trees of her family estate and the, and the dictates of her fanatically religious father. When Nigeria is shaken by a military coup, Kambili's father sends her to live with her aunt. There she discovers life and love and a terrible bruising secret deep within her family. So that's the tea on that. Um, but I didn't film on the Monday and then on the Tuesday all I said was the fact that I was 27 pages into this book um, and that I was confused um, but the confusion later sorts itself out. I was just basically confused about the first chapter and when it took place because then the next sort of chapter was something completely different but it was just a lack of attention on my part. Um, so yeah I just wanted to introduce it. Um, I was seeing the next couple of clips where I talk in depth about this book. If you do want to read this book I would recommend not watching this video because I do talk about it in depth so if you want to read it and then um, know everything about it continue to watch the video but yeah um, I will catch you in the next couple of clips. Hey guys so today is Wednesday and I am going to check in with my August in Africa readathon. I know I'm saying this I'm basically vlogging every single day until the end of August. Um, I mentioned yesterday that I was going to dye my hair. You might be able to see it's tinged with purple. You might not be. Um, that's not really what I wanted. This hair's annoying me anyway, and yeah, I'm just a bit annoyed. But anyway, I'm going to talk about Purple Cool Biscuits because yesterday I did start reading it. Um, I wanted to check in, but then my dinner was ready, so then I didn't. Um, but I did read a good chunk of it yesterday, and honestly, some of it just took me by surprise, and I've been reading some more today, so I thought I would just check in and talk about it. When I last spoke to you, I said that I wasn't sure if the first chapter and the second sort of chapter, um, if they were talking about two different dads in this book. I don't think she is. I think what's actually happened is the first chapter is her talking about a moment, and then, which is like a moment of, I guess, um, the brother rebelling um and you know standing up to the dad defying the dad and then the second chapter he seems like a different person i think the second chapter is her recounting and the second chapter and so forth is her recounting how we got to the first chapter so i think that's what's happening i'm not too sure i won't really know until i finish the book but i think that's what's happening so this book deals with kimbili and her family kimbili's family are super super religious or at least you think She's very religious, her brother's quite religious, her mum is religious, and the dad is super religious. In the world of the church, you know, he is the man that, you know, has donated the most, everyone thinks he's so kind, he's very powerful, you know, he owns his own factory, donates loads of money to the church, and he also works for, I think it must be like an independent newspaper in Nigeria, at least the only newspaper that's willing to criticise the um, government, or at least I think, as we go far further into the book, the head of state. Um, and it's very interesting because from that you think, okay, yes, um, and the way he's being described by her is the fact that he's very modest. So you're listening to all of this and you're thinking, oh, okay, um, this is very interesting. But then you find out behind closed doors it's a very different story. He's a very strict man, he's a very, like, religious, pious man, but he also beats his children. Like, he, you know, wants to instill the fear of God into them. Like, he legit says that one of the things you know children who don't fear god and you're just like oh it reminds me a lot of like just african bring upbringing when you're just like you don't fear anyone but anyway um he so yeah you quickly find out that you know all is normal it seems and all of this is kind of hinted it's all very subtle um until a moment happens in the book where her mom tells her tells kabili that she's pregnant and Everyone's really happy for her, it's really fine. And then they go to church, um, and after church they stop by to visit one of the priests. I think he's usually the head priest, and he's not the head priest there for... The, he's not leading the sermon that day. So then they go home. I think everything is kind of normal, I'm not really too sure at this point. And then the girl goes to her room, because the dad has set up a really strict schedule for her and her brother. And, you know, there's room for... Um, I was going to say uni. <laughs> there's room for school, study study the bible and obviously when there's church you're going to church so you know she's off to do her schedule of studying 
Um, and then she says something about waiting for the sound and then she was like, something like dad's bed moving or something. Um, and then I counted the number of sounds that I heard um, and stopped at 19. And then at that point her brother walks out of the room and they go downstairs. Go downstairs to see the dad carrying the mum over his shoulder with blood trickling across the floor. And I was just reading this like, what the fuck has just happened to you? I have just read a paragraph about domestic abuse, domestic violence, and it has been so subtly done, or I'm not the biggest, like, these things can go in my head when it's very lyrical, waxy writing, and it's obviously not being very explicit, it will go over my head. So I had to read it a couple of times just to make sure. Um, but I also understand sort of why maybe as a reader you wouldn't understand what was happening because our 15 year old narrator is quite naive, her world's very closed. Um, and yeah, the mum comes back the next day. He takes the mum to hospital after beating her and takes her to hospital and the next day and he comes home to his kid and says your mum will be fine. The next day she returns home and she's lost the baby. He beat her so badly that she lost the baby. And I'm just like, what the fuck are we dealing with here? Like. I was just like trigger warnings like of course I don't believe the books need trigger warnings but I was just like I was not expecting that like no I haven't read much about this book I've read what's in the blurb but nowhere have I heard anyone anyone talk about this book and mention that I guess I know it's a huge spoiler but I was just like whoa um so anyway incidents like that happen and you find out that you know this is not a regular occurrence but this happens in the household it happens that they sometimes get beaten by the dad as well he really wants them to be religious pious people you know he didn't send them to a sort of Christian westernized church school for them to be second best. So when she comes second at school, she's really, really worried. Um, you know, in the past it's led to a beating for her. So you quickly find out that a lot of their world is basically based around fear. Their dad is super religious and he is a very deep believer of Christianity. Um, when he was younger, missionaries came to, I guess, the place he lived in Nigeria, and he was taught all about Christianity, and he took that very seriously. Now, here is where you find out how seriously he takes it. Basically, this guy will disregard anything that's not to do with Christianity. So he's disregarded speaking in Igbo, which is the tribe that they are from, um, and the fishermen, the tribe that they were from, um, or at least the tribe they belonged to was Yoruba. So he disregards them speaking in, in Igbo, like he hates it because it's not English. Um, he only wants people to speak to him in English. Um, you know, he has denounced his father because he says his father is a pagan because his father still believes in the traditional sort of gods that Nigeria had or Nigerians had before Christianity came into there. It's all a bit wild and you can just see like everything for him is based on what has been told to him by these missionaries, which is basically what this comes down to is he values a lot of things on its proximity to whiteness because the missionaries that came and spoke to him and told him all about Christianity were obviously white people. The head of the church that he goes and they visit their house is a white man and he's someone he really respects. Um, so it just seems like he has really denounced his, I say, yeah, he's denounced his country, he's denounced his tribe for the proximity to whiteness. Everything is only good um, as long as it's close to, I guess, what white people and what Christianity, I would say what white people, but what Christianity and the Christianity is coming from white people, what they believe. Um, so it's just very interesting. I'm like, why has no one spoken about this in this book? It's such an interesting, like there's so many layers to this, it's insane. Um, anyway, we get to this one point in the book where they go to, I guess, their summer home, except it's not a summer home, they're going there at Christmas. Um, and it's a village, I guess, and all the people there speak to him in English because they know he detests Igbo. Um, and it's there you meet his sister, so the Kambili's aunt, and you see how like sheltered her life is and how much no one in the family knows like what is going on. They know the dad, the dad's name is Eugene, they know he is like, you know, straight laced, he's Christian, um, but they don't know obviously the fact that he beats his children, that he beats his wife and that their family is just like, they're so sad, they're so scared of him, it's insane. Um, and it's there she sort of, um, sees her cousin again and I just remember this one bit where she's talking about her cousin and her cousin's mum so her aunt wearing lipstick and she was like I just wonder what it would be like to have colour across my lips because she's not allowed to do anything but anyway you see the differences in sort of her life and her cousin's life um how they the kids are free to laugh like even things things like laughing is mentioned in here so it was a very interesting thing to see and anyway I'm at the point where the dad has agreed that the 
Kambini and her brother can go and stay with their aunt for a week. Their aunt says she wants to take them to some place where apparently like the Virgin Mary was sighted or something like that. She is a university lecturer. Um, so I'm just at the point where they're about to go off and meet her. They've, yeah, waved goodbye to their dad. Um, and I think it's obviously here where we're gonna sort of find out on the back where it says, there she discovers life and love and a terrible bruising secret deep within her family. Um, there's also a bit in the back here where it says, when Nigeria is shaken by a military coup, Kambidi's father sends her to live with her aunt. Oh, for some reason, I don't know why I imagine that her aunt lives in America. She doesn't. Okay, so she goes to live with her aunt, but I don't think that's um, in the section that I'm about to read. I have also been reading Kenke for Airways. I say reading, listening to Kenke for Airways. And um, I listened to two stories today. I just, I'm struggling to remember what the second story was, but the first story was really nice. It, was, it opens up with um, a woman talking about her husband on the hospital bed, um, talking about their life together, how they met, just, just basically their life um, and all the things that they've been through um, and ends with him, like his eye, eyelids fluttering. But obviously the main bulk of the story is her talking about how they met, um, how he helped her through her grieving process when her parents passed away, um, them having a child, just those little things, you know, the day-to-day -day things that what happens when you build a life with someone. So I thought that story was really nice. I thought it was really nicely written um, and it actually reminded me a little bit of Grief is the Thing with Feathers, um, just talking about that sort of grief and what you miss about a person and how you start recounting what your life was like with that person. Um, obviously in this one he doesn't actually die, but yeah, you know she thinks he's dying while well, he is dying um and i can't remember the second story so that's interesting but yeah i'm going to continue listening to that um, i'm trying to do it so that it's two stories a day um because i mean they're only five to ten minutes long at most i think um so yeah i'm going to continue to listen to that and i don't think i'll finish that by the end of august but definitely i will have finished this so yeah i will check in with you tomorrow and talk more about this book i have a feeling like i'm just going to sit through really sad part it's just so interesting to me that the two books that i've obviously read for this um readathon have just been really harrowing that they have dealt with such deep topics that just i don't know i don't see it coming and i find myself reading it and engrossed in it and just so overwhelmed by it um which is good Your books are supposed to give you emotion you know sometimes it, it's escapism but also kind of dread escapism when it's really really fucking sad but yeah we'll see but yeah i'll catch up with you tomorrow hey everyone welcome back today is saturday which is the last day for the august in africa readathon and i finished up purple hibiscus so i thought i'd come on here and finish up talking about it i finished it yesterday so i didn't film anything yesterday and the day before um hasn't been a great couple of days but we're back we're good and yeah i finished reading this um and i just thought what a wonderfully crafted book i ended up giving this four out of five stars because whereas i loved it um i guess i didn't love it that much um and there really isn't any real reason for that other than just general feeling so i think the last time i spoke about this book um we had our main character kambili who was at her cousin's house and maybe she was just going back to her parents house um it's such an interesting story they go back home um and no sorry i think i wouldn't they would have been still at their grandparents house or maybe they went back again another time but anyway not their grandparents their auntie's house several acts of violence take place and in my head i'm getting them really jumbled up but you know there's the act of violence against his two kids where he ends up pouring hot water on their feet to teach them a lesson that's in terms of them like having stayed in the house with their grandfather and not talk, telling him. There's another particular incident which basically leads to Camille and her brother going back to stay with her auntie, which is, I guess, the most severe case of beating that happens to Kambili in this book. I, there's violence against her mother as well, but their grandfather has passed away and there's a painting that is given to them by their cousin and Kambili and her brother are looking at it one day and her dad catches them. Um, and I guess the grief that Kambili has not been able to um, display sort of kicks in. He rips the picture into tiny little pictures, um, tiny little pieces, and she sort of throws herself at the pieces. And he starts kicking her like she won't get up. He's like, "What's wrong with you?" You know, he starts beating her. And um, at a point that in the book that she's just like, "I'm not even sure what I was being hit with." And then like she blacks out and then wakes up in hospital. Um, and then I'm not sure if it was suggested by her dad, her auntie, or her mum but her and her brother go and stay with her auntie for a bit. They say it's because of the coop, but I know bad things are happening, but it's also the fact that 
this beating was so severe no one in the hospital ever asked her what it was and it's obviously because everyone knows that the dad is beating the shit out of everyone like it's insane um and essentially the book sort of continues like that they go back to their cousin um um they stay with her um her cousin basically just says like it was uncle eugene that did this to you and completely says i think she does say yes maybe she doesn't answer and then like that's all the cousin needs like the cousin then all of a sudden realizes like why her own cousin is the way she is um and after that it's more about Kambili's growth but there's not like that much detail that goes into her sort of growth but it's what you would imagine as someone who's recovering from such a severe beating there would be growth um and yeah it's just about her sort of sitting in the house with her auntie um her cousin sort of enjoying that life she starts to learn more about her brother things about her brother that like she didn't really know in terms of his personality and things like that and you know she talks about little pieces like how she wonders how it's so easy for him to sit here and laugh and things like that where she feels petrified anyway there's a lot of healing taking place um and then i guess all of this sort of wonderful scene is distracted by the fact that the mum comes to the place um and she says you know i just got out of hospital and then i came straight here and then the auntie who's obviously the mum's sister-in-law was just like why have you gotten out of hospital and it's obvious she's gotten out of hospital because once again her husband has been beating her so severely that she's had to be in hospital um and then she, you know, like I guess with someone who suffers from domestic violence, is like, you know, I was just being silly, like I'll go home tomorrow. You know, um, he calls, um, and I think he comes and picks them up. And basically, I just got mail, so that means I forgot on where I was at. But I'm just going to drop the big spoiler. Um, the dad ends up dying. He ends up dying. Um, the kids are at the aunt's when they find this out. Um, so it must mean the mum went back home at that point. I'd, at this point, so I'm not, the book wasn't confusing in the sense that when they were going back and forth it was confusing. I'm just now confusing it in my head. Um, but yeah, the dad has passed away so they have to return home. They return home, um, loads of mourning for them, for the dad, etc, etc, until they get a call from the hospital. Um, poison has been found in the dad's um, um, blood test and at this point it's worth mentioning that because the dad owns some sort of newspaper where they publish views, but I spoke about this before, but where they publish views where they heavily criticise the head of state or the government. Um, his other counterpart opens a package and gets blown up by it basically. So initially when the dad dies they think it's something to do with that. Um, but then the tests come back and he's been poisoned and the mum sits the kids down and basically says, I poisoned your dad. The police come and the son basically says, I'm the one that did it. And they just take the son away. So then the last chapter of the book is basically them recounting the fact that the brother has been in prison for three years. She does go back to talk about that initial scene, so um, if I had been reading the um, chapter intro more clearly, clearly, like the bit that introduces the chapters I would have seen, the, the incident she describes in the first day is Palm Sunday, um, everything else that comes after that is um, sort of the things that took place before Palm Sunday and then it's like after Palm Sunday and then so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, the brother ends up spending three years in jail and at the end of this book they're basically saying that he's being released. Um, we don't get to see that release but that is basically the good news that they're bringing. And much like The Fisherman, it's that, that story about the destruction of a family. Um, and in this case it's the destruction of a family due to like, I guess, serious like religiousness. It's, you know, this thing where missionaries have come and taught them about Catholicism so, you know, the dad follows the Catholic way of life like I spoke about earlier for me it's a lot to do with the sort of proximity to whiteness because the dad was also really concerned with them speaking English getting the best western education um you know having other people speak to him in English because he thought Igbo was just you know a sign of like people just being messy and just not good enough um so I thought the book did a very um did it justice in the way of talking about that um and you know the justifications not justifications that's the wrong word but the use of saying why he heavily beat his kids, that he wanted them to be perfect, he, he kept telling them, you know, God expects you to be perfect, I have to do these things to you so that you can be perfect, and, you know, he was doing these things and, you know, crying while he was doing it, and for me as a reader, I was just like, I'm not here for that, but it was, it was a journey, it was a very emotional journey, and it was just so nice to hear about it from, from Kibili's point of view. I still thought for her age, she was quite... I don't know what the word is but she didn't seem to take in a lot but I guess the severe abuse makes up for, no it doesn't make up for that but the severe, severe abuse allows you to make sense of that and um, there's so much that she you knows she's battling with in her head um, and there is a bit in the book which I am um, 
bookmarked because I actually forgot my original point now because there were two points I was going to make about what I bookmarked in the book. But I bookmarked this one bit where I think it's a really important point to think about in the sense of how he obviously put the fear of God into these kids. Um, and the brother says, in, in, in relation to Kambili saying something about like God works in mysterious ways, the brother says, of course God does. Look what he did to his faithful servant Job, even his own son. But have you ever wondered why? Why did he have to murder his own son so that we could be saved? Why didn't he just go ahead and save us? I thought it was just a very interesting question about, um, I guess, you know, religion and Christianity. Because um, for these two kids, you can't imagine, like, you know, being told that God will save them from everything and things like that, but then they're going through this immense pain because their father is so religious in a sense they're going through this immense pain because of god and the brother is right to ask that why why didn't he just save them why did he have to take the dad away in order to save them but yes really really enjoyed this book i thought it was wonderfully crafted the writing was great you know in the beginning i and i said it just now about i think the only thing i probably have a struggle with is Kimbili's age in regards to how she tells the story but i get it her sheltered life maybe just leads her to sort of tell things in a certain way but I kind of felt like she could have been like nine years old the way that she sort of spoke about things and just behaved it didn't sound like a 15 year old girl to me but with all the abuse that she suffered I can kind of see why that is the book ends with a ton of changes her family her auntie and her cousins have moved to um, America her and her parents are still well her and her mum are still in Nigeria obviously because of her brother being in prison but you know there's still hope at the end of this book there's hope that you know that three of them can grow from this and they can be better and that they will get over it over it i thought it was just a wonderful story i also keep coming back to the fact that the back says you know there's a terrible bruising secret and i just keep coming back to the word bruising and i just feel like their whole life at least can be his whole life was just one big bruise hopefully now that's not what it's going to be like but it just kept coming back to me you know obviously i guess to do with all the beatings and stuff like that but also the emotional abuse and just how she wasn't able to connect with any of her peers at school because you know they couldn't talk about these things but anyway that is my review on this book those are my thoughts on this book it's been good reading like dedicating myself to books that you know have that focus of africa obviously um again another book set in nigeria and the fisherman was set in nigeria um i think i no i haven't listened to any more stories from ken k for airways um but that's okay i'll probably continue to do that throughout the month of september but that is me done for this vlog i'm sorry that there was no other bits of interesting footage i really didn't do much this week so i didn't have anywhere to go and um, so yeah but i hope you enjoyed me enjoyed hearing me talk about the book if you've read this book and want to chat about it in the comments please feel free to because i would love to have a good chat about it there's probably loads of things that i've like glossed over or missed out but i try my best i will catch you in another video bye